So welcome everyone to the final panel of today. I'm really excited um, for this panel. There's a lot of brilliant people speaking. Um, I, my name is Quill Christy Peters and I'm the Director of Education for the ACC. Um, and I'm going to introduce Sarah, who is the moderator for today's panel. So Sarah Biscara Dilly is a multi multidisciplinary artist, curator, writer, educator, and member of the Yak Tichu Tichu Yak Tahini Northern Chumash tribe, currently residing in Hui Kyun, which is Oakland, the unceded homeland of the Chochenyo Olone people. Her interdisciplinary process is grounded in collaboration across experiences, communities, and place. So please join me in a round of applause in welcoming Sarah. Hello? Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> just checking. I'll yak teach you, teach you yak musquiam, wa yak squamish, wa yak still what to Miko totlo ni pa'as bo's bo tasitutio. Hatio mita serabas garadili, wa mitana yakitanas mutil hinka teach you. Kiss you teach you ka atakatla, ni sithala, wa samimu, wa takaya. Wa Tizimasu, Wa Eloehe, Wa Asaram, Wa Casas Grandes, Wa La Piedad, Wa Silkoshoyo, Wa Tilhini, Wa Wemea, Wa Setakawa. So Hyamp Ni Puhuchun Nits Pu, Titu, Titu, Tasitana Chochenyo. Mita Kana, Wa Mikana, Wa Na Nits Pu, Tilhinka Titu, Wa Mi Istiono, Wa Yak Titu, Titu, Le Klekle, Wa Yakitanas Mut Core Group. Wa Yak Tichu Tichu Yak Tilhini Land Acquisition Team, Wa University of California uh, Davis, Department of Native American Studies. Tasja pa tasju yamnoko, tashlehini yamnoko. So I am first uh, thanking the people, the homeland peoples here, the Musqueam, uh, the Squamish, and the Slewotuth communities. Um, I'm acknowledging that I'm a visitor in their beautiful homelands. Um, I'm telling you what my name is, that I'm speaking the language of Tilhini, also known as the place of the full moon, also known as San Luis Obispo, California. I come from many villages throughout San Luis Obispo County and northern or southern Monterey County. You could call it Little Sur. We're just south of Big Sur. Um, also family in central and northern Mexico and also family from the Hawaiian Islands and Sweden. Um, I'm letting you know that I live in the homeland of the Chechenyo speaking people um, at Huchun, also known as Oakland, California. And I'm letting you know the, the people that I listen to and I learn from, um, and this includes my homelands, my family, uh, the Yak Tichu Tichu singers, of which I'm a member, um, the language core team that I'm a part of, the land acquisition team that I'm constantly scheming with, um, and the fact that I'm a PhD candidate at the University of California, Davis. Um, and just closing with the fact that after these last three days and visiting in these places that uh, my heart is, is, is good and my heart is full. Um, I'd like to not waste any more time talking, although my, my cousin's going to be very proud of how much language I just used, <laughs> and pass it along to our panelists today, Faith Sparrow, Jamin Lavalle, Sarah Hunt, Carol McGregor, and Taloy Havini, who will be sharing some about their practice and speaking about and from the communities we work within. Um, just a round of applause for them being here. Thank you. Me first. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to apologize first for this. I am not a seasoned public speaker, um, and so I had to write it out word for word. Otherwise, it would just be a rambling mess up here. <laughs> so I'm sorry that I might fumble over paper here, but I'm going to try my best. CM Nesiaya, Faith Sparrow Quinnesquich, Talitza Nak Humathquiam, John Sparrow Thanaten. Thalihultan Kwanasitla, Shrienam Kthanat Amaquash, E Manet Art Thanat Amaquash, I Tanashkwaloan Quats E Quatsnala. Hi everyone, my name is Faith Sparrow and I'm from the Musqueam Indian Band. My mother is John Sparrow, my grandfather is Willard Sparrow, and my great grandparents are Ed and Rose Sparrow. 
I think it's important for me to start in the words of my people, in the language of my people. For me, having somewhat learned Hunkaminam, it is so much more than saying words aloud. To me, it's healing. It's healing the land, because that is where we got our language. And it's healing our ancestors who are not allowed to speak these words. When I began learning my language, my mother shared a story with me. She spoke of her grandfather, my great-grandfather, Ed, and how she asked him one day why he never spoke Hunkaminam or taught her how to learn. He began to cry what she said she had never seen him do before. He said that he never taught her because he didn't want her to be punished the way he was for speaking his language. I believe I'm making him proud by speaking in his tongue. I'm healing his hurt and others that have suffered like he had. When I was asked to be on this panel, I was honestly overwhelmed. <laughs> I was even more overwhelmed when I saw the rest of the panelists, and so I began preparing and harassing Quill <laughs> with a bunch of emails. Um, I don't consider myself an artist, and I wasn't really sure what I was going to say, um, but I come from a long line of storytellers, so I decided I should start with a story. I'd like to share a piece of my family history with you. When my great-grandfather, Ed, was a young boy, he lived with his family in the last inhabited Musqueam village in Stanley Park. He was raised there with a deep understanding of who he was as a Musqueam person, speaking our traditional language and having the knowledge of our people surround him at all times. He lived on and with the land that his people, my people, the Humathqueam, never ceded. He was taught that the land is our mother, our caretaker, and our life giver and that we have a respons responsibility to take care of her. He was taught that we take care of the land and one another by practicing our culture, speaking our language that was given to us by the creator, and walking in a good way. At around the age of five, he was ripped from his home, his land, by the Juanitam. They took him and his family from their homes, put them on boats, and took them to the reserve where he would live the rest of his life. They told him and his family to look back at their village as they moved away from shore. He looked back to see his home and his village up in flames. The Hunitam were trying to erase them from the land, but little did they know the Humathquiam came from the land. Their knowledge is in the land and cannot be erased. My great-grandfather still grew to become a brilliant Humathquiam man and leader despite the Hunitam efforts to erase who he was. He grew to be a master fisherman that knew the water better than anyone else. My great-grandfather was my mother's only father figure. She was the only woman my grandfather ever taught to fish. She explained to me that he taught her to be more than a fisherman, but a caretaker of the water. He raised her to be a warrior. He taught her the of the ties that we hold to the land that can never be diminished. We are strong Humathquiam people, and indigenous people cannot be broken so easily. It was his memory that kept Coast Salish weaving alive in our community. He showed his granddaughters, my aunts, Musqueam weaving for the first time when he was in his 80s. Before that, he hadn't seen a woman weave in our community since he was a young boy, sitting under the loom while his grandmother wove above him. He connected these women through time, continuing on the practice of oral history and telling stories that make up who we are. I tell this story, his story, and this one in particular, because it depicts the resilience of our people and because he has informed who I am as a Musqueam woman and as an aspiring artist, filmmaker, and storyteller. I grew up in my community, Musqueam, surrounded daily by our culture and our teachings. We are a strong people, and we have always upheld our responsibility to one another and to the land. I've always been deeply rooted in who I am as a Musqueam woman. Being Musqueam informs all aspects of my life. It also gives me a deep responsibility to Indigenous peoples. Everything I do, I do with our communities in mind. What can I do to create a better future for our people? Being Musqueam informed my decision to, for my major at UBC, First Nations and Indigenous Studies, where I learned from brilliant minds, one of whom is a panelist here with me, and another reason why I was very intimidated by this panel. <laughs> I finished my degree with the intent of taking a year off and working in my community and then applying for law school. I thought I would do the most good as a lawyer fighting for indigenous rights. It just seemed like a logical step for me. 
I began working in my community as the self-governance community coordinator, helping to build our constitution and negotiate our self-government agreement with the federal government. This job made me realize that politics and law was not my thing. <laughs> it wasn't the, I wasn't the best at reading policies or trying to create them. I was frequently frustrated that those working in the government, those that we were negotiating with on our governance, weren't aware of the true history of what our people faced um, or understood our worldview that informed our governance structures and way of life. But what this job did make me realize is that storytelling and art is my thing. My favorite part of working in, this, in my community was sitting with elders and listening to their stories. I was so inspired and I made this decision to turn toward my passion, film. I realized that the best way to, for me to fulfill the responsibility I feel to create a better future for our people is by sharing our stories with broad audiences, creating awareness and change through entertainment. My family is in the film industry, so it was also a, natu a natural step for me to take. Um, I began writing scripts nonstop, and now it's all I want to do. Now I focus on creating space for Indigenous people and Indigenous stories in film. Sharing our history, our culture, our language, our art on the screen gives the audience a chance to understand us on a basic human-to-human -human level. And to me, that's the first step of actual reconciliation. The film industry isn't an easy, film to break, isn't, isn't an easy field to break into for Indigenous peoples, though. The film industry is a predominantly white male industry. Something I've always noticed that there, is that there's a huge lack of indigenous representation in film and television, both on screen and behind the camera. And it never made sense to me. Film seemed like such a natural fit for us because we are people with a oral history. It is in our blood to tell stories. Oral history was what connected us to each other. We needed each other to recall history and tell these stories so we never forget them. And so we never forget who we are and where we come from. I realized by speaking to the youth in my community that they're also inspired by film and would love to be in the industry, but simply had no idea how to get involved or what was available to them. There are so many barriers to indigenous people joining Vancouver's film industry. This is something I've frequently discussed with non-indigenous friends in the industry, many of whom have tried to understand and want very desperately to be allies to indigenous people in film. A few have expressed the desire to support the establishment of a mentorship program, one that would be led by indigenous peoples with the understanding of barriers to accessing employment in the film industry, but where they could provide technical support as mentors. And I hope a mentorship program like this will manifest in Vancouver in the coming years. I was already working to share stories and create space for indigenous people indigenous content on screen, but I also felt the need to create space for indigenous people behind the camera. I don't have the means to create a mentorship program just yet, so I assessed what I could do in the meantime and started another task. I created a locations liaison company with another indigenous woman in the industry. Both of us were dedicated to giving indigenous people, namely from the local First Nations, uh, the opportunity to work on our own territory in film. It gives them an entry point into the industry and allows them to work on their own lands. And it gives them the opportunity to learn about what different departments are in the industry through prep, production, and wrap. I see fumbling. <laughs> I consistently seek out other indigenous people in film and encourage indigenous peoples interested in film to pursue this path in the hopes of creating a community of creatives that foster and support one another and indigenous stories. So when I was reflecting on the details of this panel, specifically the question, how do we want to work with each other as arts workers from different indigenous nations? I thought of how traditionally our communities relied on each other to uphold our histories. The teachings my great grandfather passed down about how we called witnesses from other communities, shared ceremony and supported one another came to my mind. We relied on each other for access to resources and for support. Indigenous life is so deeply rooted in kinship. And to me, that's what I want incorporated into the arts. That is how I want to work as a storyteller. Our work, our art, only becomes stronger when we have the support system of other artists working with a common goal, to share meaningful stories, knowledge, and teachings. Vancouver, in particular, has such a booming film industry, I would love to see a collective here of Indigenous filmmakers with diverse skill sets that can provide a network of resources to one another, much like we did traditionally and still do. 
I'm trying to create this type of community within my own nation, sharing these opportunities, but I also think it's necessary to do so on a larger scale across nations. Creating a strong community of indigenous filmmakers that make good, meaningful works of art on the screen can only benefit the greater film community. Together, indigenous people taking up this space will only create more opportunity for inclusion in, in the future and inspire youth in upcoming generations that they too have beautiful voices and stories to share. Thank you all so much for listening to me <laughs> ramble on here and putting up with my paper shuffling. Hi, um, I'm also very nervous, so I apologize if it comes out in one big ramble. Um, uh, no, Jamin Kuyensna Tina Chintla Hamalchistin, Anwanox Tin Squalwins, sorry, Deborah Baker A. Jim Lavalley Tan Athtach. Um, so I just wanted to quickly introduce myself in the Skohotmish Um My background is on my mom's side. I'm Skohotmish and Kwakwakiwak from a bunch of different nations within the Kwakwakiwak. And then on my dad's side, I am Anishinaabe and Lakota and Métis. Um, and I too was very nervous when Quill asked me to be on this panel because I had been racking my brain and I was like, oh, how can I say that I'm an artist because I don't really feel like one. Um, I became very interested in my language in the, in the last three years on my Kwakwakiwak side. And I felt like I didn't really have a connection to my Kwakwakiwak community as much as I do with my Skohotmish community because I grew up on the North Shore on the, in the village of Hamalchiston. Um, and I was really fortunate for that because I had such a strong community in North Van and I was, I'm really grateful um, to have that. Um, but growing up, because we lived there and because my grandmother moved down um, and she passed away when I was quite young, I didn't have as much of a connection to that. And so, sorry, I'm so nervous. <laughs> I also wrote notes that um, I'm gonna try and speak from the heart. Um, so three years ago when I enrolled into UBC, there was a Kwakwala course, and I was like, oh, this is such a great opportunity to get to know other Kwakwakiwak -Kwa people. I wasn't sure what to expect. And I ended up meeting one of my cousins who was the elder who taught part of the course. Um, and it kind of sent me on this like crazy journey. Um, and it really helped me find who I was because I really struggled with mental health issues a few years ago. And I feel like what really brought me back was my Kwakwakiwak community in Vancouver. Um, and although I wasn't necessarily on the land of our people, like I still felt like we had this big community that I hadn't had a chance to access until I went to the Kwakwala course. Um, so through that, I ended up um, wanting to connect with someone from my community who came down to Vancouver um, and ended up meeting Marianne Nicholson and Althea Thalberger. And they were working on a community project called Hech Sa'am. Um, and so I ended up being an, um, an artist that worked with another emerging artist on an animation that we called, um, I can't remember what it's, what it's called right now, but it was on crab apples. And I became, <laughs> um, oh, it was called Nate Nauk, to, to return. And I felt like that was really, that. So in Kwakwala, it means to return, to return home, to return to the place where you're from. And um, I chose that word because um, I felt like I was returning back to my community. And this project really helped facilitate that. And it was embedded within communities. So there was a bunch of different emerging artists who I got to meet from my community, um, which I felt really grateful for. And we created this animation that was taken from an excerpt from Franz Boas and George Hunt's work. Um, and I'm a descendant of George Hunt, like Sarah, and um, he would have been my great, great, great grandfather. 
But I became really interested in his work because of, he was one of my relatives, um, but also more so because I think a lot of his information came from women. And so George Hunt was a ethnographer who was half Tlingit and half English. And his wives, he had two wives, and the first wife was who I descend from, and her name was Lucy. And he, she was Quagios, and then his second wife was from Blendon Harbor. And so I really wanted to work with his work because he did a lot of language work and created an orthography um, for Kwakwala, which is the writing system. But it's really inaccessible and it's really hard to understand. Um, so I decided to decode it and make it more accessible to community through using a community-based orthography that was created by the Kwakwakiwak called Utmista. And that was really amazing to experience. And so I worked with another artist named Juliana Spire, who is Zaudenach, and that's from Kinkam Inlet. And um, we created this, I think, an 11 minute animation about harvesting crab apples. And so two summers ago, we worked on it. And then we actually had the opportunity to go out to our territory and harvest crab apples and make crab apple jelly, which was really, really, really powerful because we were forced so forcibly removed from those lands where women harvested and had their root gardens. And so it was our way of um, asserting our jurisdiction again over that land. And so we created this art piece um, to say that we're still here and we're still occupying these lands. And it was, it was kind of to also help with the right, rights and title case that the Zawadena launched um, recently. And so, yeah, that was one of the art, one of the first art pieces that I worked on. And that led me to, um, I took Sarah's class this past summer, and I was also intimidated that she was on this panel. I was like, can I drop out? <laughs> I can't talk. Um, yeah, so, but I'm really glad I'm here. I'm really grateful that I get to speak with her on this panel. Um, so I was in her class and I, I took one of our origin stories and I'm quick Sutinuch and the quick Sutinuch people, um, their village is predominantly on Guilford Island on the, on the, it's so if you head up to Port Hardy and you go to the adjacent mainland, um, it's a small village on an island in between those two areas. Um, and that was where my great, great, great grandfather was from, and his name was Johnny Scow, and he was the head chief of the Quick Sutinuch. And so I decided to explore my Quick Sutinuch side by working with another Quick Sutinuch um, student that was in Sarah's class, and then we also had another non Kwakwakiwak person working with us. But what I decided to do was to take that version of the origin story that George Hunt and Franz Boas published, and I I was looking for the place names and I mapped them out into this uh, Google Maps. I'm hoping to do something different with it going forward. But what it was more so really about the process of looking through the origin story and it was about, um, for me it was about learning the place names and, I, and through l reading our origin story, um, I was able to figure more out about the clan, or what we call the Namima that I'm from, and where different dances and names come from within my family, because everything comes from our origin stories. And so it was really powerful, and I cried the first time I read it, because it, it also really connected to me to everyone who has heard it in the past, and everyone who's going to be going forward after me, and everyone who is quick Sidenuch, and related to that story. It, it wasn't really just like this linear way of passing down information, it was like this giant web of connections. And so, and it felt really moving because it connected to me to my grandmother and my great-grandmother and my great-great-grandfather. And um, they really left a legacy for me that they really cared for our community, like, um, and what they were able to do for our community 
because they asserted their jurisdiction over the land when they were taking away our territory, when the McKenna McGride Commission came in and they allocated our people to our small reserves. They, my great, great, great grandfather um, went to the commission and asked for our lands and he said, this, this is Kwikzutinuk territory and um, we use these lands and, and we're here and they ended up being put on this like par like postage stamp size place. And so it was really important for me to make these stories accessible for our community members and to also um, connect Kwakwakiwak people in diaspora that aren't able to be like actually like in the communities. And so that's one of the things I'd like to do moving forward. I'm currently doing um, the NITEP program at UBC, and so I'm in my final year of the Indigenous Teacher Education Program. And what I hope to do after this is to uh, work with an elder to learn Kwakwala and to make these stories and these histories accessible to everyone in my community. And I hope that has made sense. <laughs> um, yeah, but thank you so much for being here. Hoi uh, and thank you. It's very quiet in here. Is it just me? It's very quiet. Um, well, Gila Kasla, I'm Sarah Hunt, um, or Tlali Tlila Ogwa. Um, I'm still learning, I don't know our language, so I'm learning how to pronounce my own name still. Um, oh, I do have a clicker, don't I? That's my name. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. I thought I would, um, I too am nervous, so I'm just say that. Uh, and I, I, I usually have notes written out. Um, that's sort of my comfort zone. Um, in, our, in our community, we have people who are trained and paid to speak for us in our ceremonies, in our spaces of business. Um, and I'm not one of those people. So uh, from when I was, um, I think, a teenager, I kind of force myself to speak publicly. Um, so I think it's it's good to just sort of normalize that um, speaking is not um, natural to all of us. When you see a speaker from our community, you know they're a speaker because they don't need a microphone and their voice is booming and loud. And um, so, yeah, there's many different ways to, to approach speaking, but just to put that out there. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about um, I guess sort of the roots of my practice. Um, I'm not an artist, but I grew up in a family of artists. Um, I'm now a scholar, I guess, but I didn't grow up in a family of scholars. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the roots of um, the work that I do in community. And um, this is a, a poster from an event that I, um, coordinated in some ways when I was listening to curators speaking on the previous panels um, some of what I do I think is sort of akin to curatorial work in that um, it's sort of bringing all the pieces together building relationships and connections um, and it, it took me a while to actually find out what my name uh, means for various reasons um, and then when I finally found out what it meant, I was told um, that it means someone who goes around inviting people. And um, that has really helped to give me kind of an orientation for my work uh, and who I am. Because, uh, you know, the university, before I was in the university, I was, um, I did contract work with various government ministries and they're always trying to kind of discipline us into um, different structures, different ways of seeing what's valuable in our work, uh, ways of, you know, I think the previous panels really spoke powerfully to that as well, um, uh, looking for certain kinds of outputs or things that can be counted at the end, um, certain ways of, you know, forms of clarity that will make sense to a non-Indigenous audience. And um, so thinking about being someone who goes around inviting people um, has been useful in uh, thinking about how I carry that name with me um, in the work that I do and the different spaces that I'm in um, that is orienting me to this place, so to the 
the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh um, peoples whose territories we're on um, and that I live and work on now that have always had relationships among our people as coastal people. And so thinking about that as an orientation, um, that keeps me um, kind of clear, I guess a clarity in that uh, as to what matters, what, what, what I value um, in, in the work that I do and no matter what space I'm in. So, um, so I wanted to share that and also that um, I grew up on the, the Songhees Reserve in the Kwangan territories in what's now called Victoria. Um, and really as a queer young person, um, found myself often in queer spaces where I was the only indigenous person and indigenous spaces where I was the only out queer person and um, kind of moving between those spaces uh, really, I guess the sort of DIY culture of my youth is still very much um, kind of a part of what I do and how I even see my role in the university, which is thinking about, um, you know, the fact that things don't get done unless we do them for ourselves and that we uh, create the kinds of spaces or projects um, or whatever opportunities that are needed because our community relations let us know that they're needed. Um, and so that's really what drives, I guess, the work that I do in thinking about community um, is that I think my name has no meaning without that community, the context it comes from, the land, the people, um, and only has meaning in those contexts. In other contexts, that name ha doesn't have meaning. Um, and so I think about uh, that also, that the, the community relations um, that give me that orientation are how I make sense of myself in the world. And that's why <laughs> being within institutions where we, you know, it doesn't make sense, it's because it, it's disorienting that there's a completely different kind of capitalist Western framework that doesn't, it's confusing to me. So, um, so for me, I think about those roots and kind of um, uh, like DIY queer culture um, drives what I do. Uh, and also, um, growing up in uh, a family of artists where, um, similar to what Jamin was talking about, um, there are a lot of male artists in, our, in my family who are very well recognized, um, as well as um, sort of those ancestors like George Hunt, um, who are well documented in, in anthropology books and um, you can go to the library and read about them or take a class and people will talk about them. Um, but that there are um, women and other gender diverse relations who, um, who hold the stories, um, the knowledge, the practice, the dance, um, everything that makes that artwork or that knowledge possible. That there's a whole system of, of people that, um, in which the artwork or whatever it is is being created. Um, and I think especially seeing in my family how um, artworks that are, uh, you know, there are individual artists whose name goes on a, <laughs> um, like there's something that goes into a gallery space or whatever, um, but that that comes out of a whole community and cultural context in which um, people harvested the cedar, people who owe the stories that, um, from which the figures uh, are connected to, the places that they're connected to, um, as well as just the revitalization of the potlatch or the continuation of that despite it being made illegal for 80 years. Um, people who made regalia and held it in secret, like there are all these other relations who make it possible for artists to do what they do. Um, and that work is often so invisible. Um, and in some ways that is, I guess, where I would locate myself is in that often unseen, um, invisible work, um, and especially being in queer community where so many um, of our relatives um, and, and myself uh, have been disconnected from community because of stigma and the impacts of, um, of various kinds of violence and homophobia and transphobia and heteropatriarchy, uh, that, uh, that um, bringing those those folks, those of us back into relation uh, is kind of, I guess, where I see my practice, um, whatever 
I can't call it curatorial work because I'm not a curator. I don't really see myself as an academic. So whatever this is that I'm doing, uh, this practice is uh, in those spaces. And um, so hopefully this is making sense. Uh, so this uh, event here, um, I thought was a good example of that because um, it was an event that we held um, at UBC it was because of some of the anti-violence work that was going on on campus and discussions of um, kind of rape culture on campus, but that was really position, I kept, was getting frustrated seeing indigenous people only be cited as a statistic um, that was at risk in this work and then the people who were voicing what these issues were were not indigenous and um, not seeing indigenous people as leaders in anti-violence work, um, not seeing indigenous people as having pre-existing cultures based on consent or, or practices of consent or thinking about what existed here before rape culture was brought here. Um, and so um, I organized this event and um, had indigenous people come and talk about this theme um, in a way that was very open, um, that was not scripted, that was non-hierarchical, there was not just academics, it was just various people who, who are concerned with this work. Um, and because of my previous relationship with the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, Erin Consmo um, uh, graciously made this beautiful poster and, uh, and really allowed us to provide a space for Indigenous people to come together to talk about violence on the land, um, uh, intergenerational violence, but in a way that was um, not trauma based. <laughs> that wasn't just throwing our trauma stories out there as so often happen. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, that kind of, again, thinking about kind of the role of um, going around inviting people, I guess, to me, I felt after this event that um, that I was on the right path. There was sort of a clarity in that. Um, and it kind of just emerged out of, out of responding to that need, I guess. Um, and so I guess one of the, this is, this is a photo from um, the Tribal Journeys a couple of years ago. And um, I think about uh, the shoreline, uh, so the shore, um, all across the coast, but um, also I have begun doing sort of work across the Pacific with some Maori, um, queer Maori folks um, who also do a lot of anti-violence work um, and thinking about um, how we are connected across our shorelines. Um, so that's why this space is obviously, I was very excited to <laughs> be able to share this space with all of you um, because uh, there's a lot of, I guess, resonances as coastal people uh, in the kind of our worldviews, um, even though they're, they're very different at the same time, there are some um, connections there. And, um, and so I think being able to um, allow work to um, grow through just kind of relationally, so thinking about so often, again, the academy um, or various other kinds of um, institutions try to, um, I guess there's certain, again, there's certain values that drive or dictate what happens, but instead to allow um, the work to emerge out of relationships. So um, I worked with the Youth Council for the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, for example, to do some um, peer research on how the term at risk can kind of re-stigmatize young people and, um, that just emerged because I had a relationship with some of the youth on that council. Uh, and my role, again, was just sort of behind the scenes, getting the money and um, helping with various phases, but uh, that I don't see myself at the center of the work, but just helping to get the money from the people who have it to the people who, <laughs> who should have it, because somebody's gonna get that money, so it might as well be us. That's kind of my, <laughs> my um, guiding principle. Um, and, Another recent project that I've been working um, with has been a group in Victoria called Sacred, which is a group of current and former sex workers, uh, indigenous sex workers. And um, uh, so thinking about the ways in which stigma uh, in our communities in various ways pushes people out of, of ceremonial spaces, cultural work, um, I think that um, we all, have, we all have an inherent right to our culture and 
we all have um, an inherent um, right to be seen as members of our nations. And so um, uh, for me, the um, just the privilege of being able to have, I guess, mostly it's just access to funding to be able to, uh, to bring people together uh, or for other people to, to bring themselves together um, uh, is, is really directed at trying to um, overcome the, the violence that stigma causes, uh, various kinds of stigma. Um, or discrimination that our communities have internalized uh, in order to bring us together and and into closer relation with each other. So um, over the course of the last year, we just had our last workshop. Um, we uh, had members of Sacred, this group, coming together, and um, we had a drum created for the group uh, because ceremony and cultural practice was what people wanted to focus on. Um, I think there's various pots of money the government will give you to do work on, there it's assumed that because if you're a current or former sex worker, you wanna talk about violence or do anti-violence work, but no, folks wanted to learn to um, make teas and to learn about the land that they're on and various other things. So um, we had a drum made and um, this was the last workshop was, um, at the beach there just outside of, of Victoria. Um, and it's really, uh, again, there's no public, I guess I was really interested listening to the previous panels, thinking about all the work besides what is made publicly visible in an exhibition. I think it's similar, this work, um, there are actually some things that the group did uh, together that will become publicly visible, so they created, um, we had a poetry workshop and they wrote a poem collectively together that's in a collection called Hustling Verse that just came out that was edited by Justin Ducharme and uh, Amber Dawn. Um, but so much of the work is about b the building of relationships and the practices that are not intended to be public. And so the questions before about kind of what we share and um, I think guess there's what we share with each other and then what we share kind of publicly um, as well. So. Um, I have no idea how long I've been talking, so I will just, uh, and what did I want to talk about here? Um, I guess for me, so so my sort of driving, I guess, force, just to wrap up, is around thinking about justice and how we practice that in our intimate spaces, not just in relation to land rights or, um, or again, externally focused notions of justice with the government or those kinds of things, but internally focused concepts of justice within our own bodies, our relationships between our bodies, our bodies and our lands and our, and our families and communities. Um, and so um, thinking about how we re-embed or ourselves within those relations in which justice is possible, um, again, in ways that are not always publicly visible or documented, or won't be seen by anyone other than the few people that are involved in it. Um, but to me, when I think about what it means to do community work, um, that is the true community work. It's, it's the stuff that never really gets seen, I guess, except in these panels where we're talking about it. So <laughs> thanks for giving me the opportunity to share. Gila Kessler. Thank you. Um, I'm just really humbled to, to be here uh, and I'd like to just acknowledge the first peoples of this land and um, uh, all the first peoples in the room. Um, and yeah, thank Tara, actually, I was just thinking, if it wasn't for that studio visit last year, you came to visit me in Brooklyn while I was at ICP, maybe I wouldn't be here today. Um, and so, I thank you for that, and it was the most meaningful studio visit I had, uh, actually, for that six months. And um, to bring people together and learn and share is just incredible. I, I've come from the other side of the Pacific, or the Great Ocean. Um, 
I'd like to acknowledge my ancestors. Um, I come from the Nakas tribe uh, in Bougainville, and Bougainville is uh, it's a it's a colonial name. It's a French man, Bougainville. Uh, he did never set foot on the island, but he he was leaving Tahiti on the way back and came past Bougainville, the Solomon Islands, where the largest group of that uh, archipelago. And so the Spanish had already been there and then Bougainville named this island after himself. And then he kept coming north and he found another island and that's the island where my ancestors are from. And he asked the men and the women in the, the boats fishing, he said, you know, what is this land behind you? And he also, you know, he spoke French. Uh, <laughs> Our people didn't speak French. And so they said, Boca. And so Boca actually translates to what? You know, what are you talking about? We don't understand you. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we're from the land of what? Or Boca. <laughs> uh, <but, laughs> so it's all a bit strange. Um, but I think I'll, I'll, I currently reside, and I'm a visitor on Gadigal land in Sydney. I have a studio residency with Artspace, um, and so I'm a visitor in, in unceded lands in Australia. Um, and I'm, I'm glad people are talking about their, their families because I didn't think that I would, but um, I'll start this story with my mother. She's uh, an Australian um, of Welsh, Scottish, Irish, background as most colonial people are in Australia, descendants of uh, invaders. Um, and she trained as a painter in Sydney and um, met my father who came from Bougainville via Papua New Guinea. He was one of the first um, sort of cohorts in the university uh, to come down to Australia. So Australia is uh, uh, a colonial power in Papua New Guinea, in Bougainville. Um, so he had met her, uh, and I guess it was love at first sight, and they swapped um, mail, you know, like they became pen pals. So she had graduated and finished her uh, arts degree, but like most mothers, she gave up her own career to... Uh, teach and um, I guess marry and, and, and provide. So she had met my father and decided to be one of those first Australian people to uh, go to Papua New Guinea and, and live there and work. She was very unusual like that because most Australians that went to Papua New Guinea went to work in the mines. Um, so they went for, uh, for riches and so she, she went there and she was teaching at the uh, university, the same university that my father uh, was still studying um, policy and law. And when the Australian colonial authorities found out that she was dating a, a black man or an indigenous man, she lost her teacher's accommodation. So in the 60s, it was very unusual for a white woman uh, to be with an Indigenous man. But it wasn't unusual for a white man to adulterate with Indigenous women. Um, so, it, it, in the 1960s, you know, and I'm, I think it was uh, pretty tough for them, and so since then she's been living with the natives. <laughs> um, uh, my father said to her, you know, if you want to marry me, you have to marry me last. Um, you have to marry my people first, my clan, and then me. And so she said, sure, I'll take it all. Um, <laughs> so when they felt a lot of racism and hostility in Papua New Guinea, uh, went back to my father's tribal land, and my father's people accepted her. And uh, so instead of marrying him, she had to become adopted into the clan. And she was given a name, and from that ceremony, all of her future children, which I'm, you know, the last born, uh, we would have to 
our lineage became rerouted through my father's eldest sister, and she is a chief woman. So, oh, so nervous talking about my family. Um, but she, my, so my father brought us up to be um, in a matriarchal society. Um, and yeah, I think he's very, he was very much, he's since passed that he was a chief and he was son of a paramount chief and the only university graduate in our village. And then he said to me, you have to go to university too. Um, and I sort of turned to mum and I said, well, art school's part of university, right? She was like, yeah, I'm like, cool, I'll go to art school. Um, and they've been my biggest supporters, my, my village, my community. Um, my, my grandfather, he, his name is Havini. Uh, we all have different names. We all have names from our ancestors. Talwe is an ancestor. Um, and so my father brought us up strangely through, you know, through my father's land, through his sisters, through my grandmother. We now live on that land. And um, it's interesting because a lot of people sort of over time I make work in this Habitat series that's in this exhibition. Um, and sort of a lot of sort of feminist people are, are drawn to the work or you talk to them and, and I just sort of say, no, it's not, I don't consider myself a feminist because a feminist is a response to the patriarchy and that even in feminism, there's waves of feminism, whereas matriarchy, it's an indigeneity and it's been there since time immemorial and it's not after or before, it's just, that's what it is, our matriarchal land system. And so, just to give a bit of context, right now, Bougainville, uh, my parents, I grew up in a very activist sort of family. Um, they were part of uh, declaring independence. Um, they call it a UDI, but that sounds so <laughs> rude. Um, <laughs> it's like Unilateral Declaration of Independence. Yeah, they've tried three times, oh, two, twice. In, when Papua New Guinea got their independence from Australia in 1975, my parents were raising the flag as well in Bougainville wanting to be independent, and yet Papua New Guinea just didn't want that, so they sent in the right police. And... Um, that was in 75, and then I was born in the 80s, uh, and then I tried again in 1990, and that, that was when I was a nine-year-old, and uh, I remember the police coming in, and, and then the army, and then for the next 10 years, we've had a civil war. So Papua New Guinea became our colonizers. Um, and so, I've lived in Australia and studied there. Um, and I have to say the communities, like this panel is interesting because uh, I have a, still a connection with my community on my tribal lands, but the diaspora community in Australia, the Pacific community, the queer community, the indigenous community, the contemporary art scene community, um, in solidarity with each other, that's such an important community no matter where you are. And we're a community right now here this last few days, so um, that, that's what really informs my work. Um, I studied uh, in, in, in Australia in the Canberra School of Art. Um, I studied ceramics and photo media. And I wasn't a very good ceramic student because all they wanted me to do was throw on a wheel and <laughs> mould and a cast, but I was very much into making on my own hands. Everything must have its own thumbprint or, or um, touch to it, you know. So this work is called uh, Beruana, which um, translates as shell money. And I had been making uh, this, just as you do in your studio, um, on my own for a while. and. It, 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 it was a sort of an opportunity to exhibit something that takes up space or holds space. And so I was looking at um, this idea that we have our own forms of currency and we can still live and survive without um, this currency that's forced upon us. Um, 
that's come from another world. Um, and so, yeah, we still use shell money in ceremonial uh, occasions. Uh, it's not a barter kind of currency. It's, it's, it's based on kinship and relationships. When someone passes, goes into the ancestral realm, all our shell money that has been with us for generations comes out and it's hung from the Chuhana, uh, which is our most sacred uh, meeting house. And so this is all uh, reclaimed pers uh, porcelain and earthenware uh, shell money and um, hung up. So this is the work that's in the exhibition at the moment. Uh, it's called Habitat. It's, it's Habitat for me. I've been working on this series for, uh, since 2015. So it's my form of documenting the world around me. And often when I look at lens-based work or photography, or I often think it's like a reflection. Um, we might be looking into the, something in a story, but we're also... It's more about the person behind the camera or the people behind that. And so Habitat is uh, obviously relating to place and land. Uh, and Bougainville, I grew up in a mining town, Arawa, uh, in Bougainville. And it's the cause of the Civil War is the global extraction of people's lands. Uh, and so if it goes for about 10 minutes and... It, it spans, it's a journey through the land from where the town is, the mine, it's a copper, it's a gold mine, to the sludge all the way down to the west coast, into the ocean. And they've, in the 70s, they were blowing up sacred mountains, um, poisoning all the rivers, copper leaching the rivers. We've lost huge trees, uh, whole lands have become swamps. Um, all birds have gone and it's like a desert scape. So, yeah, for the, for the last, since 2015, I've been documenting the change. Um, and this last iteration, I was able to use archives. So it was, um, it was an opportunity for me to show a work in Australia that People thought it was about a work in the Pacific, but it's actually about Australia. It was about Australia's colonial, uh, patriarchal raping of the, of, the, of the land. And in there, I was able to uh, source Australian news footage as well. So each... each um, there's so many different types of film um, types, actually. I became a real nerd. You've got like 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter, high eight, super eight, uh, VHS, 4K, and that's every decade of every sort of digital um, era. I've been able to trace Australia's colonial relationship with Bougainville and the people. So uh, it was actually hard work to make uh, because it does confront a lot of the violence and the human rights abuses that happened on that land. But I'm an extremely privileged person uh, to be an artist and to make a work, to make an archive myself was uh, the, 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 the main thing to do. And I showed it at the Asia Pacific Triennial, which is Australia's uh, in Goma, Gallery of Modern Art or Queensland Art Gallery, which shows people, you know, artists from all over the Pacific and Asia and Australia and my community, the diaspora community, I was actually really nervous. They were my toughest audience, is my people. And, um, and it was good because uh, it was traumatic to show that footage. Uh, people older than me uh, in their 50s could relate to that protest time. Um, people have lost, we've lost over 20,000 people in that conflict, in that war. Um, and yet World War II gets more sort of, people talk about World War II in the Pacific and Kokoda Trail and, you know, JF Kennedy was, uh, was on Solomon Islands. Um, but no one ever talks about this war. That we've lost actually 20,000 indigenous people due to uh, Australia, Papua New Guinea, not wanting to give up 
their hold on this copper mine, this gold mine. So uh, this year, I'm actually going home next uh, tomorrow and then next week uh, I'll be going back to Bougainville and we get to vote for independence in November. So Bougainville, we could be finally a uh, uh, self-determining nation, the newest nation in the Pacific, or we might not be, <laughs> we don't know. We've tried three times. Uh, it's a battle my father tried and uh, unfortunately is not around to, to be here to vote. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting times for our people. So that's, that's a bit of a context for you. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Tanoi. Um, my name's Carol McGregor. Um, I'd really like to acknowledge that we're on unceded territory here today and also um, pay my respects to the three nations, their ancestors, their elders, their community and any other First Nations people in the room today. I'm honoured to be a guest here and I really thank you for your hospitality. We've been made most welcome. Lots of food, good food and lots of wonderful company and uh, so far I've learnt so much and made so many... Um, friends, so thank you. Yeah. Um, today I'm going to talk about one of my. I'm an artist, and I'm going to talk about my practice with possum skin cloaks, and some of the reasons why I've made possum skin cloaks, and also my community work around possum skin cloaks. Um, I started making cloaks around about uh, 15 years ago. I'm a Wathaurong woman, and through my father, and a Scottish woman through my mother, and my father's Wathaurong. Great, uh, grandmother, my great grandmother Annie Robertson. Um, she was a seamstress and she was a woman that was moved from her homelands and she ended up in Aotearoa in New Zealand and that's where I was born. I've never lived on my ancestors' country and I've lived in Tasmania at the bottom of um, Australia. Um, our mob is from, um, yeah, she, my great-grandmother Annie was born in Geelong, which is also at the bottom of Australia, but not in Tasmania. And I've lived for the last 35 years in um, Brisbane, in Mianjin, Turrbal and Yuggera country as a visitor and a guest there. Um, this is, and this image here is the back of my uh, family's possum skin cloak, which is the first possum skin cloak I made. Um, it's a contemporary possum skin cloak. You cannot see the stories on this one because um, I didn't really want to talk about too much about my family, but I will say a few things about the Possum Skin Cloak um, contemporary revival. Um, I was fortunate enough to go through art school with another kori, um, elder uh, Annie um, Glennis Briggs, and she had learnt Possum Skin Cloak making from one of the Victor senior Victorian cloak makers. And I'm honoured to um, tell you that there's a senior Victorian cloak maker in the room today. I wasn't going to say this, but Arnie Vicky Cousins is here and I'm honoured to be in her presence. Um, this revival was really important because I see that making this cloak um, as a connection to my great-grandmother, my Wadarong great-grandmother. And, um, and on the inside, traditionally when you were... I'll just tell you a little bit traditional possum skin cloaks, when you were born you were given a few skins and on the inside they were incised um, with either muscle shell and rock and then ochres or pigments from the land, clays from the land were rubbed into these um, designs, these cuts with fats and which preserved the cloak but these designs were designs of country, of totems, of tribal designs and uh, maybe maps of countries and journeys. So they were really um, important pieces of your identity and as you grew your cloak grew and your designs and your cloak grew with you and quite often you were buried in your cloak. So I saw that this family cloak was a really pulling together of my family and since making this cloak my uncles and my father's generation have come together and talked more about their Aboriginality. I think my grandfather's generation was really silenced um, about being Aboriginal. We lived in Aotearoa, but we were not Māori and we were not Pākehā, we were not white. So we stayed in the back, we were taught to stay in the background and just work hard. 
um, I felt growing up and when I was in Australia that I had a lot of stories and I went to art school and that's where I met Glennis and together we made our family possum skin cloaks. Um, but after making this cloak, I'd been living with my community um, on um, Turrbal and Yagara country for about 30 years, and so integrating and being welcomed into the community as a guest. And I'd been reading about their histories and talking to a lot of elders, and I'd been showing my possum skin cloak because I'd been reading about the possum skin cloaks in southeast Queensland, which is up north in Australia. Um, and... So, and a lot of the, lot of the communities there didn't realise that they their ancestors wore the cloaks. So I said to Glennis that I'd really love to do workshops and teach people how to make these contemporary cloaks and so they can re-wear their cloaks now and bring them back into their community practices. And so um, I was lucky enough to um, be in a situation with our State Library Queensland um, we had an Indigenous unit there, the Kuril Dargan team, and approaching them to do a community project. And it was only going to be a very simple project, one cloak with community. And I think the, the Indigenous team there um, decided that it was such a good project that they needed to expand it and make it a lot larger. And it became this huge exhibition called Art of the Skins. And I... Um, with Glennis, we facilitated around about 50 or 60 workshops. And some of these workshops were with um, different communities and not necessarily just One Nation communities. We saw our contemporary communities, and especially around um, Yange and Brisbane, as being very fractured. So bringing people together in these workshops was really important. And I've got a few images about some of the process so that we can work through this work to get to the work that I'm showing in Transits and Returns. And here we see on the Gold Coast, this is the Gold Coast Community Cloak, and we've got Annie Glennis Briggs and Annie Maureen Newton just looking at the cloak, planning where all the designs are. We invited community members and we got around about 120 people to put designs on the skins and to make up their store, to, to make up one community cloak that they had access to and could use. And the stories that were, that were put on the skins were stories that could be shared and they will travel with each of the cloaks. But um, just in this whole process, working with community, people just loved learning about, or even touching the possum skins, which we ethically sourced from Aotearoa, because we weren't allowed to um, take any native possums, the native to Australia, but they were introduced into New Zealand and where the government have a culling program. So we're very fortunate that um, we're allowed to get the skins from there and we pay respects to that country for, and the people of that country for allowing us to do that. But in this image here, I, uh, just teaching people to sew the skins or just having that visceral feel of the skins is really, um, I don't know, a lot of people felt it very honoured to, to be part of that process. And also we used um, ochres that had been gifted to us by traditional owners to put onto the skins or people bought their own ochres. And this, oh, actually, it's a little bit out of order. I'll just go through. They learnt also we burnt onto the skins. Um, one of the um, senior artists of the area, Melinda Serico, she had actually burnt previously onto a kangaroo hide, skin hide. And that was actually in the 1950s that was quite traditional to do in that area. Almost like tourist art, but um, it was very beautiful too to put their designs on the skins in that way. So we... Um, carried on burning onto the skins and using ochres, and you can see the process here of one of the um, community participants burning into the skin with a burning tool. And that's also the process that I was taught through Glennis, through the senior Victorian cloak makers too. And then just using the ochres to colour in um, the designs. And we used ochres that we were allowed that all the community could use. Some ochres um, are quite sacred in many um, mobs or tribes and so it was we were lucky to be gifted for this project to be gifted ochres that everyone can use um, we made six community cloaks in all and everyone's designs was recorded the state library or the Kuril Dargan team from the state library Queensland State Library did a wonderful job in the exhibition and, and I think I got all the stories and recorded them all and they um, put them in a map and this is the Gubby Gubby Kabi Kabi cloak, which is probably the only traditional um, 
own a cloak or one nation cloak that we made, but this, and they only used their ochres from country. But what was really nice about this cloak, we made it on their winter camping grounds. We actually all went up and camped for a few days on their winter camping grounds and started this cloak and looked at all the research. I gathered all the research and um, presented it all to them so that they could go through it and understand what had been written about their cloaks. And it, it took me around about two years talking to elders and um, getting um, permissions and just respecting just the protocols within each community. So it was two years before I actually even approached the State Library with this project and just researching and, and talking to people and having a yarn. So that actually took a longer time. I think we spent a year doing um, uh, workshops and I did a lot of what I call grassroots workshops, just having at people's... Um, kitchen tables, having cup of teas and, and making the skins with them there, if, especially if people could not travel to any of the workshops. So I really love this whole process of this um, project and that we had the flexibility to do that. There were, there were deadlines and timelines for the exhibition, but um, we still ran on um, what we call Murray time there in, um, in Queensland, and it was still a beautiful process. One of the things I, that... Um, I didn't, I learnt a lot on the way, um, working with community and, and, and doing researching archives. One of the artists, Melinda Serico, um, she's given me permission to tell the story. We um, looked at some of the writings on the cloaks in that area, the Gubby Gubby cloaks, and they talked about, um, the anthropological writings talked about really rude designs put on their cloaks and poor representations of MU feet on their cloaks. And so the community, after reading some of these these um, items about MU feet on their cloak decided to put a header on their cloak of just MU feet artwork on their cloak so it would actually head their cloak like the old cloaks who mainly had these designs on there. And um, I said to um, Melinda, the senior artist, and she said she would do have the responsibility of doing this. And so she said she would do it at home in her own studio. So I left her with the burning tools and, and what she was going to do, and we discussed what she was going to do, and she said she would, I'd, I'd, get back, I'd go and visit her in about a week. And after two weeks, I hadn't heard from her. She wasn't answering her phone. So I thought, oh, I'll just go and call round and, and have a yarn and have a cup of tea. And I found her, and um, she had so much trouble. She was still at the drawing stage um, of her design, she said, I cannot seem to get poor representations of MU feet. She was trying to do bad art on her cloak because that's what the, that's what the, you know, that was what was written about their cloaks. And I just all of a sudden realised that, you know, I'd been researching and understood that this voice was from an other, from our others, you know, from people that were other, otherness to us. They didn't understand our way. They didn't even understand what these designs meant. They were outsiders. So we had a good discussion and she was just like so relieved. It was almost like, yes, it was a, it was a true decolonising process that I didn't realise that I hadn't um, explained that enough to the artist in that circumstance. So I learned a lot from that. And it was good that I'm a good friend with her. So um, we could work for that. And I, I tell you, within two days, she'd done the whole header on the cloak. So, and it was just so beautiful to see her work. And I've added all these extra feathers. And, and she did a really beautiful job. So um, yeah, it's, it's wonderful doing um, working with community members because you learn from them. You give to them, but you also learn and receive so much back. This is just a shot of the exhibition, and um, there's only three traditional cloaks left in the world today. Two are in the Melbourne Museum at the moment, are being housed there, and one is housed in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. Um, we, only, the, um, we only had a photograph of an Aboriginal woman wearing a cloak, which is highlighted in this exhibition. And the Kuril Dargan team and Fraser uh, Freya Carmichael was one of the um, curators on the team, created the space in the middle that the cloaks were housed. And I know that all these, we talked about this, and I said, can we please have a reflection space that people can sit and listen to the voices on the cloaks? And so the, the, that was set up in the middle, and um, then all the um, research and the documentation of all the workshops and 
was set up in another room at the back. And it was really um, a really strong exhibition, but so many people were surprised to see possum skin cloaks in Queensland. They didn't realise that they came up that so far up north. So it was lovely to for the participants, but also for the general public to realise the diversity of our culture. This is just a photograph of Melinda Serico, that artist I was talking about, um, wearing her cloak on her um, Kenilworth, at Kenilworth on her Gubby Gubby country. And working with community, I think uh, over the last, this four years for that project is that um, I gathered a lot of stories. I'm really interested in the plants that ancestors use for medicine, for food, for making implements. And I'd made a, um, with some of the stories, some of the elders and community talk to me about, I'd asked whether I could make one of my own um, artworks on a cloak, and this is Black Seeds, and it talks about all the, it's a map, it's a map just of Brisbane, Mianjin, and just um, some of the plants that are mapped out there in their particular places where they were found. And I really loved doing this work, and I loved talking to community about this work, and sharing those stories, and just having those voices and trying to make something that was quite, how the landscape was quite rich and quite beautiful and the guardianship of that landscape and the deep Aboriginal knowledges that were here and are still held here. And so um, when I was approached by Freya for the commute and um, I was commissioned to make a larger work, I thought I'd really like to explore this further because there's still more voices to go onto, these, onto this cloak. And so this work, um, Skin Country was made, which is more of a greater Brisbane. So we have um, seven different tribes here. The Jinnabara, the Gabi Gabi Kabi Kabi, the Kwandamuka people, the um, Turrbal, the um, Yagara, the Yagarapul, and the Yugambeh people are all represented here on the cloak. So I had a lot of yarns. <laughs> but it was, again, the artwork was just sort of like the cream on the top. It was really all the process and the yarning and the mapping out of where these stories of these plants went. And the first thing was the elders' voices were privileged. If one elder said, you must have this particular tree here, and there's a sight line because it was a really important um, sacred pathway to this other particular area or other tree there. So I always position those first. And I was gifted through the Art of the Skins project, that community project, a lot of ochres, and I've used them. And I've used them in an almost a way, like a watercolour way. So it's only ochres from the earth used, and I've mixed all different colours um, to make this cloak. And then position those, I think there's over 180 different plants there from coastal, through inland, through mountain, through dry country, through um, yeah, freshwater country and saltwater country. So, um, and I really did an oversized cloak because I felt that the stories were big and I really wanted the viewer to, or someone to sit there and realise how important these stories are, but also be enveloped by the knowledges, the deep knowledges that I felt I had to represent on this cloak. Um, this cloak is more of an artwork. Those other community cloaks have gone into the community. They're used for welcome to countries. They're used in ceremonies. They're used for um, even babies, being wrapped in babies, even um, school graduations. So it was really, this work is a little bit different in that it's more of a gallery work, but I still feel that the presence that I was um, wanting all those voices. So I see it as a collaborative work that I'm just a facilitator for those voices and those stories. And it was interesting just um, documenting all the plants that go on there. I was led to quite a few different journeys. This is the peanut tree. There's little peanuts. It's a native peanut, and it's a very, very tall rainforest tree. And, um, and they're beautiful to eat. So, but it's a really unusual. I just loved holding the different seeds and the different flowers and, the, and seeing the different leaves. And I'm not a really great botanical artist, but I think I tried to capture the essence that I was told about the plants from the communities and the elders. So, um, and the only other plant I'd like to show you is the bunya, the bunya nut. Um, well, actually, that's the bunya fruit cone. And the bunya, as you can see how big that is, I went to the bunya nut festival and that's a, that used to be traditionally a gathering of 10 to 12,000 um, Aboriginal people used to come together for every, about every three years when there was a bountiful crop and share stories and share methods of making and a lot of cloaks were made in these gatherings. But going to the um, Bunya Feast, 
was a really important part of making this cloak because I knew a lot of mobs, all the, all the um, mobs or nations that were on the cloak actually travelled to this feast. But these cones, they're, they're related to, they're from the, pine, the type of pine trees, they're related to a big, um, I say like the pine nuts you put in your salads, but the, the, the size of chestnuts, so the, but they're a really rich nut and really sustainable. So I learned a lot of stories and I got to eat and try a diff lot of different plants. So it was a really um, wonderful process just having those stories. And I learned a lot, but I hope that I gave back as well. Um, yeah, and this is the back of the cloak, which you don't see, and how many skins there are. Mm. So thank you, that's my process. Yeah. Uh, but you teach you teach you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to your families and your your people for um, dreaming you into existence here today. It's been really lovely to to hear all of you talk and talk about your practice. I almost forgot I was moderating because I was just <laughs> enjoying the stories. <laughs> um, Carol, I just wanted to say that these uh, up here are pine nuts. We use them in our jewelry. Um, and I actually, when I traveled to um, Mianjin and then also to Aotearoa, um, the Monterey pine, that's like an endemic species in, in our homeland that I look at as a way, um, it only, uh, the seeds only germinate with fire and we like do a lot of, um, use a lot of fire and land management so that tree is very special. Um, those Monterey pines were all over in Mianjin and in Aotearoa, um, so it's just like always interesting to see that reflection back and forth. I've never seen a pine cone that big, though. <laughs> they don't make them that big in California. <laughs> um, so I have so many questions, mostly just because I am really interested in how each of you um, really fold in the plurality that you talk about in your work, right? Um, something that I heard each of you say is really like to acknowledge your families and your communities and um, in some ways to, um, to always include that in, in that recognition of the work that you're doing. Um, I'm curious, and uh, this is again, like this is something I negotiate on the daily too, but like how do you, how do you translate um, the kind of temporality of community, which takes time, right? If you're doing things within your own tribal communities or within your broader communities that you participate in, and then you're trying to access whether that's a timeline of the film industry or an institutional space like in like a university or an art gallery, how do you how do you create the buffer that's needed to really do that work with integrity? Um, but also like funnel as much time and resources as you can out of those institutions. <laughs> yeah. Am I answering this? <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. I'm gonna let somebody else take this first. Yeah. I suppose for me, um, working up, you know, through that project, I had to work within the community timeline and some community members I didn't get to um, speak with long enough and that was unfortunate and so I think there's always more projects to come and more um, learnings for me as well. But um, it's surprising that, um, as you say, within in those institutional spaces, I feel that that's the last thing, whereas it's the community um, that comes first, because I know that project started off as a small kitchen table. We need to teach people how to do this. We need to see more cloaks um, happening, um, people wearing cloaks, people acknowledging that um, cloaks were a big part of um, Aboriginal life here. So that was more the directive rather than for that project, rather than it being for an exhibition, which it ended up being, but, um, but the cloaks will always remain with the community. But um, yeah, the, we were lucky that it, I worked with an indigenous um, unit within an institution, and I think that makes a difference because things get done, you know. Um, and we did have f funding; it wasn't over the top funding. We got enough just to scrape through and make sure that everyone was comfortable, that people were fed, and that they were um, paid for what they needed to be paid for. So. 
But again, it would have been great to have more funding and more acknowledgement that way. But that's something I think we'll, we'll be fighting for for a, a, a long time. Um, time, yes. <laughs> uh, I think that um, at UBC, at least in my role now, I ignore a lot of emails from the institution telling me to get a form in or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I just got one actually yesterday. I think she was like, I emailed you six months ago, which was follow up from an email six months previous that I'm late on something. It's fine. Um, so I, I think I feel lucky that um, in my undergrad, uh, Christine Welsh, who's a wonderful Métis filmmaker, was a, um, she came in, I think, my last year of my undergrad to UVic, and uh, I had everything was late, and I, my, I was, because of my, um, I did an honors thesis around um, violence and was sort of realizing I need, would need more time because of um, the nature of doing that work, and she was just very clear that institutional deadlines are arbitrary and they don't actually mean anything other than that the institution needs a deadline and that they hold it very seriously, but there's always a way around it and part of her role was to help me get around it. So that's kind of how I see my role as well is that, um, you know, when we have grants that you need to, a report needs to go in, that's my role. And so the folks that I'm working with don't have to worry about that pressure. Um, and I mean, I think that also, um, I, I guess one of the things that, uh, there are some things that there isn't really, like I think about language work and other kinds of work that for me is like a lifelong thing. Um, so I used to do, a, I did actually, as I was sitting here, I was like, oh, I used to do pottery and actually I used to sew and I also wrote poetry at some point. <laughs> um, but all of these practices that, um, I think because, especially doing work on violence, um, which is often so immediate that all those other things have gotten put on hold. So I guess for myself personally, the, the long trajectory of learning my language or the long trajectory of other kinds of things is a different timeline. Um, and so um, there's always the kind of immediate short-term needs and then the longer-term um, needs, but yeah, just being a buffer, I guess, in the where there are demands associated with like annual funding cycles and stuff like that, that um, kind of knowing how to jump through those hoops is part of what I see my role as, so. Um, <clears throat> I think I can answer this. I think I understand the question. Um, <laughs> I think well, because I felt so much pressure to go to university, and um, I felt like if I didn't go, I would be deemed like some sort of failure. And so when I finally got to university, I really struggled, and I also didn't complete things on time. I think I even asked Sarah for an extension this summer. <laughs> but I was also in a language course, and so she, it was, I was really grateful that she gave me a little bit extra time to finish my final project, because it gave me time to go to my Skohomish community and be able to sit in on a two-week language class. That was immediately after, like an intensive course. Um, so, uh, even though I've really struggled with university, I've also, I also feel like I really used some of the courses in university to explore my own identity. And like even the different projects, like with Sarah's course, I was able to explore my quick Sutinach side, which I hadn't been given a chance to do because the demands of university are so intense sometimes. Um, learning about like English or like, I don't just like things that I don't really care that much about. <laughs> so like, um, and so in Sarah's class, and I guess in, uh, David Gartner's class too, he's a FNIS teacher at UBC. I also used his course as a way to explore my own identity on my Zawadenach side. And then in the First Nations and Endangered Languages department, I was able to do a few directed studies on my own language. So I think like really utilizing, if anyone does get a chance to, because I had the privilege of being able to do that, but to use university as a way to 
explore your own identity and pick projects. And mm -hmm. so I guess that's the way I kind of used it. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for me, when I think about time and uh, creating time and space for Indigenous people in film, I, I see it yeah, as one of those barriers mm -hmm. to Indigenous people stepping into the film industry because it is, it is a very uh, fast-paced deadline kind of industry where things have their own timelines and, and they're very, usually very strict. Um, and that's why I, I, I think that um, the role that I have uh, tried to create um, liaising between uh, film and the film productions and um, the property that we are, you know, our, my, our communities are working on um, allows Indigenous people, the ones that are, are working with me, um, to view the industry but not be part of their timelines and getting getting to be in this space in an adjacent way but not be under that deadline, under those times. Um, and feeling that pressure and that, um, that pressure can, when I think of the people who are working in um, the film industry, uh, the non-Indigenous people that don't understand the barriers that Indigenous people face um, in just accessing so many forms of employment, but especially in um, the film industry and accessing resources there, they just, they don't under understand those constructs and um, those barriers because they're just not aware of them. So to them or to any Indigenous person stepping into that, in that, that relationship there, um, the understanding of time just wouldn't be there between the two of them. Um, and it would lead to a kind of a toxic environment, I think, for a lot of Indigenous people who f would, you know, feel discouraged kind of off the bat um, in, the, in that situation and in a, in a lot of cases. Um, so having this kind of space where Indigenous people, um, especially from our own nations, are working on this land that is their own um, and having this in, um, this role of importance on a in a production um, that you know is integral to that production being there um, and using that space gives them this kind of s validation um, uh, and feeling of importance, but then also gives them this tool of understanding the industry without those pressures and that that issue of time. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think. Um, like in my experience, um, like when you talk about time, there's this joke, like people talk, oh, island time. But I don't, <laughs> beyond finding it, it's not funny anymore because it's like, who cares? Like who wants to be this person that's like running around nine to five, like with my people now, who cares? We, we've got everything we need and we've got each other. Let's just do the thing that needs to be done. Um, and so going against that idea of progression or something like that, like Western time, it's like, it's quite satisfying. <laughs> it's like, it'll happen when it happens. Um, and for me in my projects, it's frustrating too, because, you know, I have an exhibition deadline coming up and, <laughs> and uh, I might need something or, or do something and they'll just be like, might have to rethink that idea. <laughs> um, so, yeah... It keeps you in check, I think, like just the way Indigenous, our, our, our ways are. And um, yeah, I've just been texting my mum about, you know, I have to rebuild a shelter when I go home. You, you mentioned temporality, all our structures. Uh, we have no monuments, we don't use concrete, we use wood, natural fibres. Um, it rains, the sun, rats get in the pandanus. We have to like constantly re remake and harvest and so I was just sort of lining up saying can you get the bamboo from down the village make make it up and she's like it's wet season it's raining you're gonna have to do that quick and I'm like <laughs> you know so it's all about what's happening with people and time and seasons and um, you can't always get what you want or do what you want to do but it's a constant negotiation of what you can do you know yeah, no, I really appreciate that. It was, even with um, 
you know, our protocols tell me that I have to bring food if people are offering something to me. And, um, you know, I should have been packing, but instead I was in Tamian and Mutsun country um, with my cousin and her truck and clippers getting elderberries so I could bring jam so you don't have to eat this cake dry. <laughs> um, but yeah, just choosing to prioritize what actually nourishes us and our communities. Um, and I hear that in each of, in each of what you're saying. Um, in trying to kind of shift points of access and also um, do that work for yourselves, yeah. Um, I want to open it up to the floor because I could yammer on forever, but I won't bore you. If anybody has any questions for our panelists who have been so generous today. Not everyone all at once. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this question is for Jamin. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the process of making your animation um, in how um, the process was related to your community. That's a, a broad question. But. Good question. <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone here has ever made an animation, but it's a lot more challenging <laughs> than I thought it would be. Um, so I decided I wanted to do an animation because I felt like it was easier to reach younger generations more through animation. Um, and so I came up with the idea and I asked Juliana if she wanted to be the illustrator. Um, and so she drew out, I think, over 100 different images. <laughs> and then we, I think we used uh, Adobe to, I think we scanned every image and then we it's a really simple, simple animation. I, I should have sent it in to show everyone. But it's all um, in Quaquila, and it was really challenging to actually do that. And it took me a few days to actually record it and a few times to get the speaking right. And Quaquila is a really complex language, and they've got very like guttural words. And I was really frustrated at certain times through creating it. Um, and I guess the second part of your question was? How the making of the animation, um, the process of making the animation was related to your community. How did it connect you to your community? How or how did you draw upon community in the making of the work? Um, we consulted a few people with our idea before actually going forward with it. And I think, the what was meaningful f to me was I think we consulted with a few elders before and said what do you want instead of going in and being like we're going to give you this even though we didn't live in Kingdom and so I think it's really about like consultation within community and making them feel like they're involved um, instead of just placing it on them mm -hmm. um, and Juliana had actually grown up in Kinkum, and so she did form line design, and it's a form line design animation that's in black and white. Um, and so, I guess how it related to community, for me at least, was. Um, I think showing our people that we did occupy those lands and we did have root gardens and we did harvest crab apples. And even though those lands were farmlands at Mountain Point, that the crab apple trees are still growing there. Mm -hmm. And it was 
like, the land is so weird there now, but it's really, really beautiful to see these, like, random crabapple trees that are popping up next to farm fences. Like, the farms are no longer there, but because of the resiliency of these crabapple trees, they're now there. And I, that's one of the reasons why we created that. Yeah. Thanks. I noticed that in all of your work, it's very community-based and uh, a lot of community engagement and just wonder if, uh, if any of you or all of you could just speak to um, how that, uh, it not only informs your work, but, but how that effect comes out uh, after that work is done. And, I, and you're already touching a bit on it with the crab apples, so just on that, that uh, scope of hearing each and every one of you speak from that place. Um, just like, if you didn't have that element of, communi of community engagement, how different would it be for you? For me, if I didn't have that element of community engagement, there would just be no point in what I was doing and what you know, I like I said before, it's just uh, to me the the reason why I do what everything I do is because of my community and and because they've given so much to me, I, I owe so much to them, and it's some that's something that I I'm constantly mindful of and have been mindful of in everything that's led me to here as being somebody who's an aspiring artist and wants to create something that's meaningful, but wants to create space that's meaningful. Because if I'm just doing it for me, like what's the point? <laughs> you know, like I, I, if I'm not doing something that's helping my community, then there's just really no point in me in me doing it. So, I, when I think about um, community consultation, community in involvement, it's just a necessity. Uh, otherwise, I'm not doing anything to change the film industry in the positive way that I want to. And, uh, yeah. Um, for me, it was a big, well, it's a big part of my practice, but also a big part of my life. I, because I'm a visitor, I've um, lived in a community that's really invited me into their mob, and I feel quite at home where I am, um, even though I feel quite a part for my ancestors. But um, so me giving back and sharing skills and knowledges when I can and also being the best community person I can be in that community for them, giving support 24-7. I do a lot of teaching now and, um, and I know I've been one of the elders has made me an associate guardian of country there so I do feel attached in that way through the, through the people and it's... Um, I will get back to my country and live there one day. I know that that circle will be complete, but I feel as I've still got things to do with that community. And one of the elders said to me, um, you might only put one footstep down, but at least someone can walk in that footstep and move forward from that. And I really listen to those words of wisdom because I feel that sometimes as an artist, you do work a lot by yourself, but with a community, you get supported and you support them. and. And I know um, a lot of people that I've worked with, um, it's really fun to work with other people and you learn, learn a lot rather than being isolated, but um, you just learn so much and it's nice that you can give so much too. I think that that is what it is, being indigenous and decolonizing spaces is that doing it our way and doing it, um, you know, how you know in your heart is the proper way of doing things. And being that person, how, you know, our way of being, doing, and knowing about things. And that really, I mean, it's your lifeblood. I think it's for me, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I was just thinking, as soon as you said fun, I was like, yeah, it's fun to work with. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, you read my mind. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, oh, yeah, I was just going to say, before I was thinking, um, it's been a long time since I've been out of art school, any kind of training. But I find working with communities a kind of training and a learning, and that's enough for me. We're constantly learning from each other. 
uh, each other's experiences and, you know, um, that's why I do it. I think my personal um, motivation is... Um, because when you create, you want to create to share whatever medium you work in. And so having those people that you learn from with your stories and, you know, they're learning from you and you're creating new things together, that's a really exciting thing, actually. That's the most exciting point of working with community, I think. The other thing, too, is... I always call it unsilencing our histories, and, un and you're doing that too, Taloi, yeah, with your work, is that it's really important that... I feel as if I work poetically, uh, visually poetically, but also hopefully there's a strong message behind it, and I think that strength strengthens communities too and individuals' lives, and even if they come together in a way just making, and in my case it was cloak making, but there was weaving going on on the side and there was other lots of stories and yarns and connecting happening in workshops. So it was actually a really nice community space when you do these projects or do these things, and I think that's the essence of it too for us is to get back what we, what we really need and what we want and what we're good at. Um, I guess, um, thanks Cease for the question. Um, I struggle with my current role um, in being in an institution that values individual stardom, essentially. <laughs> they want you, to, they want to extract as much as they can get from you and for you to be visible as an individual and our communities don't operate that way, and they are, our ancestors didn't operate that way. Um, our knowledge doesn't grow that way, um, and uh, and especially kind of thinking about what I said before, just about, um, you know, most of the folks that I am in close relation with are not those individuals that are held up high. You know, I have a lot of famous Carver relatives um, who do amazing work, but um, there's so many other uh, artists and practitioners who don't, who are not going to be that one, you know, one person that's held up. And so, um, for me, I guess I think about like that's a that's only been created that one person that's been created because of capitalism and because of putting our artistic practice into that system and valuing it in that way. So, um, so yeah, for me, I think I um, I think about a lot about witnessing um, as, a, as a methodology, as part of our, our um, passing on of our knowledge, but also that we need to be able to witness each other and to, to be able to, that's kind of the communal and collective process of creating art or knowledge or whatever it is that, um, that instead of it being we're all looking up to this one person, that we're all looking at each other and that we can, that for me, it's like we have the right to be seen in that capacity. Um, and uh, yeah, when I was in my first year of my undergrad, a cousin of mine, um, people talked in the previous panel about uh, kind of losing loved ones and kind of what, what motivates them. And yeah, I, I had a cousin who uh, committed suicide and after that, uh, stories of her abuse came out that she'd spoken up and no one listened. And that, I, that is what motivates me, is that we, we are witnesses to each other so that we don't feel like we're speaking into a void. Um, and especially for those of us who are um, marginalized or stigmatized or whatever in various ways or shoved out of community spaces that, um, that were brought back into relation. And um, I, I meant to mention at the beginning that this space, uh, someone talked about the art gallery space having been a court that um, this was the Woodward's building in 2002, I think there was a big, um, this space was occupied by people who didn't want it to be gentrified, but wanted to, to be housing for, for people on the downtown east side. And um, so I think about that, you know, we, it's talked about less and less as time goes on, but um, that this is also a space that has a history of, um, of course, there's the original displacements of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh from these lands, but also um, then in the downtown east side, people who've often been displaced from their communities living here, uh, fighting for these kinds of spaces. And so I think it's important um, just to acknowledge that 
uh, to think about who's in the room and who's not and, and why. Um, so that's part of, I guess, holding myself accountable as well. One last question. <clears throat> Um, so something I've kind of been thinking about all afternoon is that uh, as Indigenous people, we have this incredible competency to communicate with one another, and like this has all felt so incredibly generative. Uh, but we're also often people who are kind of negotiating with larger institutions and having to, like, I forget who said it, but like we have to dumb ourselves down to talk about it. Um, but like we're always, um, especially when you start organizing community projects and events, there's like this hustle side of having to get them get the money. <laughs> like it comes out into this really crass kind of thing. Um, but I guess uh, my question specifically around that is if anyone has any like particular strategies that they'd like to share about like approaching these places that are not really necessarily outwardly helpful or. If, um, yeah, just experiences around that, because I think that's a really real thing. And when you get the funding, it is validating. When you don't, you just like, you don't know what you did wrong all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah. I would just say share your, everyone, me included, <laughs> to share your successful grant applications with each other. Um, I've had people share grant applications with me, which has helped me to get grants and um, and also even letters of support. Um, someone once showed me a letter, they wrote a recommendation that helped me get a grant and then now I use that to help, like what, cause it's so, it was like an amazing letter. Um, just to know like, um, how, it's a game, it's a game. There's like, it's a liter, it's, their funders have check boxes or numbers attached to certain outcomes that they want and so knowing the rubric, um, knowing people who've known how to jump through those hoops. Um, so uh, that, and that's a lot of, um, again, thinking about knowing how to translate from like funders needs to community needs. There's also grants facilitators at some uh, like universities that I've, I've actually worked with, even when I wasn't at a university, I asked them if they would please meet with me to <laughs> look at my application. Um, and that, uh, knowing people who know how to play the, well, play the system um, is really useful. So. I think it's kind of, yeah, I mean, I've never been all that successful at getting grants, but um, I think it's what, what Sarah is saying, it reminds me a lot, you know, of what I was trying to say earlier. It was just re relying on, yeah, kinship and, and pulling on people who have those resources um, to help you. Almost everything that I've done successfully, I've... When, whether it be, you know, uh, being awarded something like grant money or um, just making a project to completion, I've relied on so many other people and their skills and their, their knowledge and their support. Mm -hmm. And I try my best to provide what I have back to those people as well. So, it's, yeah, it's just relying on kinship, I think, and relying on people who have the skills that you recognize you you need support with. Yeah, I mean, I'm in a different, obvious funding or sort of policy world in this, in, in Australia, but um, I, I agree. I think the more that we share our success and um, talk talk to each other, um, but also a friend of mine the other day was 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 on a podcast and I asked her what she talked about. And she said one of the questions that um, it was for NAVA. So we have an organisation in Australia called National Association for Visual Arts and they're supposed to policy and help artists with institutions. I'm not sure if you have something like that here. Um, but they can only do so much. And I think in, in the arts we don't have a union, <laughs> you know. So we, we kind of need each other. And she said that... The, the good question is that they asked is what can we do for artists? Um, how can we support them? And she said, and I wouldn't have thought about this, but I totally agree with her. She said, yeah, get institutions to stop asking us to make a new work for nothing. Um, if you're interested in what we do, <laughs> we've already made the work, <laughs> get that thing. 
and celebrate what we do. Don't get us to fit into your box. Uh, and I was like, oh, if we all said that, then, you know, we could change the way institutions... It's giving us just a tiny bit of an ours fee and wanting a whole new body of work. That actually would help us. So if we just all sort of band together and talk and put pressure on, on the institutions, I think maybe that could help. Can I actually add something to this? <laughs> um, I need to credit my my good friend and, and colleague, Laura Galvez, um, a powerful Chinanteca woman who I go to school with. She um, got us started on working on the same grants together. Um, I think really resisting the scarcity narratives that perpetuate, in our case, it would be in academic environments, but I would say the exact same things going down in arts institutions or arts funding or creative practice to really just lateralize that interaction and understand that if any one of us is getting that grant, it's going to support all of us. So why not read each other's essays? Why not be each other's copy editors? Why not help each other understand that grant writing process and also make it social, like have food, listen to cute music, like, have fun. Like, it doesn't have to be this, like, oh, I waited to the last, like, two minutes to finish this grant application, and I'm stressed. Like, make it fun, make it collaborative, and also, like, share that process with one another, because writing grants sucks. <laughs> like, it sucks. And then you have, like, text to work from when you, like, continue to crank them out because you get, like, rejected 80% of the time. Like, you know, you just, like, you have it in place, and it gets to be something that is, like, a community process instead of something so solitary. Oh, is that it? Okay, I'm getting the the gentle nod from Terre Haute. Yeah, <laughs> lock it up. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll owe so much to uh, the contributors today. It's been really a treat to to hear about each of your practices and meet some of you in real life and. <laughs> Um, please, anyone, all the panelists first, um, but everyone who can get up here. There's a hazelnut and blue corn cake up here. It does have eggs in it, um, otherwise dairy-free, and elderberry jam from um, Tamian or jam. Let's generous. It's syrup. <laughs> yeah, it's syrup. Let's be real. Yeah. Um, but yeah, please come help yourselves. And thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. So while the panelists are getting their much deserved beautiful food, um, we do have a reception uh, to finish things off in 15 minutes. And to conclude uh, the events of this gathering, <clears throat> there's a closing remarks on the schedule. But instead of doing that, we thought we would uh, have a check-in between a few of us. So we're going to do that now instead. Um, so can I invite Quill and Stephanie to come up? Maybe we can just grab mics and sit in front of these guys. <laughs> this has been in someone's hand for a long time. Hello. Or I guess we can start at the end. Let's just talk to each other. Okay. <laughs> so, well, okay, so for, first I want to acknowledge uh, Stephanie and Quill as collaborators on this event. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Stephanie is the adult public programmer at the Vancouver Art Gallery and has been one of those behind the scenes persons for this event that has worked very hard and made it happen and has been a huge support for me as one of um, a small number of indigenous people that works at the Vancouver Art Gallery. And so uh, in this final check-in, I just wanna say thank you uh, because uh, your presence in the institution means a lot. And these are the kinds of people that, that we need on our side. <clears throat> Thank you, Tara. <laughs> yeah. And also, 
I want to thank Quill, who has rightly been um, named a number of times in this gathering um, for being responsible for um, bringing a lot of the folks from the local nations that you've heard speak today. And it's really through these community connections that we have that we can ground the work that we're doing in these really important local knowledges. Um, so thank you, Quill. <laughs> thank you, Quill. <laughs> so what do you guys think? Um, yeah, I just want to like turn to the panel and say miigwech to everyone for um, just like such generative discussion. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, the youth that are here from Thunder Bay. Um, oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, so Bethany Kustachin is here and Adrian Polson is in the back and Rena McKay is um, at the hotel at the moment. But I just want to acknowledge them because they've come like such a far away and have just been um, like blown away by the knowledge that's been shared during this um, conference. So I just want to like foreground that. Um, and yeah, just to, to start off, I guess, um, what's really important to me about this gathering is just um, the orientation of the discussions, which might seem like a, a basic um, thing, but where I like work in Thunder Bay in like Northern Ontario, discussions that are directed towards like indigenous to indigenous relationships are like attacked. And so I just wanna like acknowledge that and acknowledge that um, that takes work. Like it takes like so much labor to create a space for indigenous to indigenous um, sharing of knowledge. So that's just where I'm starting with this. Yeah, I also want to thank Tara and Quill for everything and for this collaboration. And um, I feel like I am like my heart is so full. This weekend was so enriching. Um, so I just will share that I feel very grateful to be able to have worked with the ACC and with Tara and Quill and with all the moderators and with like this exhibition. I, I feel very lucky and um, a challenge though that I feel working for a place like the Vancouver Art Gallery is that it is an institution and that, um, yeah, and that I am of settler ancestry. So I feel very lucky and I don't feel like I'm not um, welcome here, but I know that it's not, um, I just, I'm very cautious of the amount of space, I suppose, that institutions or people like us take up and I feel very, grateful and welcomed and I just love collaboration and I think that collaboration is magic and we should just all continue to work in this way and just on a point that Sarah was saying about sharing successful grants I think that's a really good idea but it also just got me to thinking that like we just like we just shouldn't have to write grants people should just give <laughs> money away <laughs> <to> <laughs> Like maybe I'm really idealistic, but that's that's just you know like <laughs> people yeah. are agreeing with you. <laughs> so I mean I'm not the director of the Vancouver Art Gallery. I've actually only lived here for a year and like eight months, and I grew up on Treaty Seven land. So um, if I had more power at the Vancouver Art Gallery, I would say just come <laughs> put some money walls. Tara, Tara has more power than we know, but power power is also there to be taken, you know what I mean? Like, this is what we're doing, and I'm looking at Vanessa, and I'm like, there's a lot of people here who um, also make space for this type of stuff that we're all doing, you know? Um, I'm also thinking about something that Sarah said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's the, that's the temporality and the time that it takes to do this work. Um, and, you know, the, the youth that are here are here because the ACC is, is involved in mentorship. And one of our primary activities, or two of our primary activities, is gathering, creating space for us to talk to one another, and creating space for us to learn together. Um, and, you know, these 
moments that we have together together are ephemeral in some ways. Many folks will be returning to their homes tomorrow, uh, and we wish them safe travel, of course. Um, and I'm really interested in how we can um, forward this knowledge, how we can build upon the work, that the good work, all of the heartfelt and really smart contributions that have been offered today. Um, and one of the great ideas that Stephanie had um, uh, is that we could create a collective body of knowledge um, if people were interested in sending us their notes from the gathering. So uh, you could transcribe them if you're a messy writer like me, or you could take a picture and send an email. Uh, and then along with the video documentation, we would have a collective document uh, that speaks to the way in which each of us uh, listens and is trying to remember what we heard today. So if anybody's interested in doing that, maybe come up and talk to us after. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I guess I also want to acknowledge um, like the other ACC staff as well, um, Camille and Camille, and even Emma, who's been like helping out as well from far away. Um, and yeah, I guess something that's just resonating with me, like overall from the gathering, is just this like um, overflowing of art as just a product-based practice, and really situating art as like all the relationships that go into um, creating something for this world. Um, that's something I really appreciate. Also, because I'm Anishinaabe, I feel like I love talking about time. <laughs> and so, like, so many people have brought up, like, time and space, and I'm just like, yes, <laughs> time and space. Um, but it's come up in just, like, so many interesting ways. Um, like, hearing Ocean Highland talk about time, linear time as a barrier to her art practice um, was really interesting and hearing last night about the ocean um, as like a relative or a being, and also just hearing all the beautiful presencing of ancestors throughout multiple panels and, and the naming of ancestors, um, I think really situates us in a place where um, we're remembering our art as existing beyond time as well and really calling into the present moment, uh, the future and the past, so that's what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also um, thought it was funny that I had this very sort of um, grandiose, poetic opening remarks about indigenous art and the shared space of that. And then the first thing that Deborah Sparrow said when she got up on stage was that I'm not an artist. <laughs> and so, you know, I think this is also part of the challenge that we have. And some of you have spoken so eloquently to this today is that we have to, and also I need to credit Natalie for saying these words earlier, um, that we have to find languages in which to talk about what we're doing. And I think that's very much part of the work that, that we're doing here together, so. And I just really want to thank Kage mm -hmm. because documentation is important and mm -hmm. <laughs> she's been doing it, or Kage's been doing it for us all weekend and thank you Kage and also at the gallery yesterday we had Stephanie helping us and I want to thank Christopher, Cheyenne, Turion who's not here with us but I, I consider Cheyenne my Vancouver mentor so uh, I want that to be on record <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah I want to thank Melanie, I want to thank mm -hmm. everyone, Celia for opening every day, um, yeah there's a lot of people to thank but those are the people in my mind right now. Well, and I also I also wanted to thank you all for being here. Um, the way that we program the day with two hour long sessions is is asking a lot, is asking for a lot of listening from you all, uh, and you've all done that very well. I think <laughs> I I've, I don't know. I just was hanging on every word today, and I felt like um, that was a shared feeling in the room. Um, and it's lovely that this music just started like yeah. 30 it's minutes ago. It's a concert ago. down in the atrium. <laughs> yeah. um, 
Do you have anything else to say about the day? Because I could also speak about tomorrow morning really briefly. Go for it, yeah. Okay. Uh, so tomorrow morning, uh, the ACC is holding our annual general meeting in this room at 9 a.m., so another early start, but we will also have, again, some, some beautiful catering <laughs> to tempt you to join us. Um, and we're always trying to uh, expand our community, both, and deepen our community, both through events like this, where uh, we build upon the knowledges that are inherent in these lands, um, and also making connections ac across the waters, just like what we did with our gathering this weekend. So if you're around to join us, please do come. Okay, did we forget anything? That's it. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Goes without saying. Yeah. Integral. Merci.